Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and this week we're going to talk about something called Lowcast. This is a service that allows you to watch over the air television for free if you're in the right location and you can use your web browser or a supported set top box app to do it. And as you can imagine, there is a lawsuit, a big one, and we're going to dive into what this is all about in this week's wrap up. So let's get to it. So let's take a look at what Locast is all about. This is their homepage. Right now I'm logged into a computer that is physically located in New York City. And as you can see, Locast is supported in the DMA in which that computer is located. So we're going to click on Watch Now. And what it's going to do here is give us a channel guide of everything that Locast is able to pick up over the air. And what they're doing is receiving those digital signals and then rebroadcasting them essentially over the internet. So for example, if I wanted to check out this Newsnet Morning Edition on some New Jersey channel here, I can click on Watch Now, and that's going to pull up the broadcast for us here, and I could make it uh, full screen and do my uh, watching there. Now this is not going to be as good of a signal as what you would get if you had an antenna attached directly to your television. So these broadcasts are going to come to you at 720p at about two and a half megabits per second or so. So there's definitely a quality difference versus the actual over the air broadcast. But if you're in a situation like me where you can't get all of your channels, uh, this is a really good alternative. And there are some integrations right now with a few different uh, set top boxes, mostly from Dish and AT&T. Uh, but of course you can get one of their apps on Roku or one of the other major streaming boxes and be able to watch the TV that way. Now Locast is not integrating any recording capabilities into their service natively, but they're not restricting other services from recording and they do have an API to allow people to connect up with it. Uh, the Channels app supports it directly. So if you're using this DVR package that runs, I think on most major platforms now, uh, you can very easily just uh, connect Locast up to channels and have it integrated with the rest of your other offerings that you're recording. I'm gonna do a video on channels and how this works in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for that. Uh, also, Plex has a little hack that you can run to do the same thing, but it's not a native uh, feature of Plex. And Locast is really picking up a lot of viewership here. They've got 2.3 million users now, and they're likely flocking to Locast because it's so easy to use, and you don't have to put up an antenna or futz around with network tuners or anything like that. And also AT&T and Dish Network are kind of steering people over uh, to the service as well, and that will be something we'll talk about as we get ourselves further into the video here. Now you might be wondering, how is this any different than Aereo, which got themselves sued out of existence not all that long ago? Uh, Aereo would allow you to rent a little tiny antenna on the roof of a data center, and then you could stream the local broadcasts that that antenna picked up. And Locast is saying, we are different because we are a nonprofit service, and when you subscribe to the service, you're actually just making a donation to cover the costs of operation. And the reason why they think this is legal is because the uh, Copyright Act of 1976 allows for a nonprofit organization to retransmit a local broadcast to people within the normal reach of that particular broadcaster. Now, of course, the internet as we know it did not exist in 1976, so they didn't contemplate uh, this type of retransmission when drafting this statute. And I was surprised that they didn't make some change to this in 1996 when the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was put together, which really overhauled a lot of US copyright law uh, to make it compatible with how the internet works. Now, of course, this hasn't prevented a lawsuit against Locast. In fact, they were probably anticipating being sued by the broadcasters. And the broadcasters have put together a pretty strongly worded lawsuit uh, that you can read at the link you see on screen here. Now, the first thing that the broadcasters are alleging here is that Locast is providing these retransmissions beyond the local service area of the broadcaster. They're also saying that Locast did not ask permission to do this, which they're not required to do. But I do think the broadcasters might have something here in regards to the geographic restrictions of the Locast service. Because if you look at the law, a secondary transmission is pretty well defined here that it cannot be made by a cable system and that it has to basically be 
uh, within the local service area of the station, uh, but not beyond that. And I think that's where Locast might run into some trouble. Now, Locast says that they do try to restrict uh, where people can watch the service. So, for example, right now, if I'm sitting in Connecticut and I load up the Locast app on my phone, it won't let me watch anything because Locast is not offering me a retransmission of stations that I can receive here in Connecticut. But if you go on to just about any VPN service these days, they are marketing themselves as being able to allow you to watch Locast from anywhere in the world. Here's an ad from ExpressVPN that I pulled up just with a simple Google search. So there are ways to very easily circumvent this. And of course, we were just doing that right now because I was logged into my shadow server, which operates out of a data center in New York City. That computer is physically located in a spot that would be legally allowed to watch the Locast broadcast. But I think where you get into shaky ground is can that server stream that broadcast to me here in Connecticut where it's not available. And that's the kind of stuff I think the broadcasters might allege here. And going back to the law here, there's also some mention of this nonprofit being allowed to do this provided they are not getting any direct or indirect commercial advantage. And that is another area that the broadcasters think they have a case uh, because they're saying that Locast is operating as its own business and there is some commercial benefit for the organization to get people to make donations. They're also accusing Locast of being in cahoots with pay TV distributors, including the Dish Network LLC. Uh, the founder of Locast, David uh, Goodfriend, uh, was an employee of DISH and then left to form the nonprofit that operates Locast. So they're accusing them of colluding together to create this organization. Uh, they also point at AT&T because AT&T made a half a million dollar donation to Locast to help them operate and perhaps pay for the lawsuit as well. Uh, so they're saying, hey, look, you know, this may be a nonprofit but its very existence actually benefits the cable TV providers significantly because it gives them leverage against the broadcasters. Why is that? Well, the broadcasters are allowed to charge DISH and AT&T and Comcast a lot of money for their broadcast to be retransmitted over those cable systems. And I'm sure you've probably been in situations where your local cable company says, hey, if we don't make a deal with your local TV station, we're not going to offer it on our cable system anymore. And the cable companies have largely been kind of in a bad spot because if they don't pay up, they could lose customers to somebody who's willing to pay the broadcaster to carry their network. In this instance, the broadcasters could say, hey, go ahead, leave us. We'll just tell our customers to download Locast and Dish and AT&T actually did just that. Now, the reason why these broadcasters are so aggressive here is that these retransmission fees are now a big chunk of their revenue. Uh, S&P Global Market Intelligence reports that in 2020, the broadcasters brought in about $12 billion through retransmission fees alone. And you might be wondering, where is Comcast in all of this? Because they are, of course, one of the biggest cable providers in the United States, but they're also a broadcaster. They own a lot of NBC stations across the country. And because of that ownership, Comcast is actually a plaintiff in the lawsuit against Locast because, again, they own a bunch of TV stations. So they went into the lawsuit under their NBC Universal LLC, which of course is part of the Comcast conglomerate. And if you check out the Comcast 10K from last year, uh, they saw significant growth in the distribution line of those broadcasters' revenues. And most of that growth, according to their statements, came from retransmission. Some of this distribution and other includes DVD and content licensing. But again, the growth here, 7.8%, is all through the increases they were able to negotiate in retransmission. And check out the advertising here. Uh, they're down 12% on their advertising business, which was usually what made broadcasters all of their money. There's a lot going on here, and that's why these uh, broadcasters are really fighting hard because this might spell the end of some TV stations. Now, if you dive into the narrative of this 10K, you can read about how important retransmission is to the broadcast side of their business. 
and how much of a threat it is to the cable side of their business. Uh, check out the 10K if you want a good read. And I don't know what goes on in the boardroom there, but I can imagine there's a lot of tension between the people that are running NBC and the people running the cable side of the business because they actually have to negotiate with themselves to get their own stations on their own cable system. And when you talk about a company being too big to fail, here's a good example of that. If you go over to this page on the Comcast website, you can actually get a rundown of all of the different contract renewals that are up, both for cable stations, but also for local broadcasters. And it looks like this month there is quite a bit, including a lot of stations that they own, because I am, of course, in Connecticut, and WVIT is a Comcast-owned station, and they're going to be negotiating with themselves, apparently, over carrying that network into the future. I'm sure they give themselves a good discount, but they have to be careful uh, to be pretty consistent between what they charge themselves and what they charge their competitors. And by the way, all of this stuff is getting paid for out of your pocket because this is what ultimately drives up the cost of your TV subscriptions. And we're seeing all this pressure now because consumers have a choice finally, and many are choosing just to opt out of this mess completely. So what are my predictions as to what happens here next? Well, I do think that Locast has a good amount of liability on the location detection. It works for the most part, but it's very easily circumvented. And I think that's an area where the broadcasters might have a strong claim. Now, another issue facing Locast is that they are kind of radioactive in the industry right now. DISH and AT&T have certainly decided to partner up with them, but many other providers have not likely out of fear that the broadcasters will exert some retribution on them for integrating Locast into their service offerings. In the counterclaim that Locast has filed against the broadcasters in this lawsuit, they bring up a number of anecdotes, including this one uh, from talks that they allegedly had with YouTube TV, uh, where the YouTube TV people told Locast that they would be punished by the big four if they decided to integrate Locast into the YouTube TV product versus paying retransmission fees. And that was something that they say led YouTube TV to not include Locast there. So I think they're going to face some uphill challenges building out the user base. And the smaller the user base, the less leverage that cable and internet providers are going to have against the broadcasters in their negotiations. So there's no question that there's a real business interest here in the broadcasters keeping the low cast user base as low as possible while the legal stuff works its way through court. So they're working the legal angles, they're working the business angles, and they're also going to be working the political angles. And I have no doubt that they're running through Congress right now trying to get that 1976 law amended to make it more difficult for more low casts to pop up. Because if low cast wins this case, you can bet there will be a lot of other similar organizations that come out of the woodwork and start offering similar services as a nonprofit. And again, the broadcasters here are battling for their survival. And I'm thinking they're going to be very aggressive here with Congress in trying to get uh, the law amended. And they have a lot of relationships in Congress. This is a very old industry. And of course, many politicians rely on TV stations to broadcast their political ads. So there are existing relationships there. So my advice to you is that if you are a happy low cast user or want low cast to come to your region, you may want to get the contact information for your two senators and your representative so that you can contact them and let them know that low cast is important to you and they should be very careful about changing the law that might allow them to continue operating. So there's going to be a lot more on this topic, I am sure. And it was really fun to just kind of dig through all the complexities of what's going on here. If you use Locast, let me know in the comments down below what you think of the service and whether or not you think they're going to survive in the next year or two. I think they might pull this off, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, especially from some of you lawyers out there who would know more about this kind of thing than I do. Now, this week's wrap-up is being brought to you, as usual, by all of you. I want to thank, first of all, Thomas Anfang, who made a contribution on one of our live streams the other day. And we also have a new supporter on the channel who contributed via Floatplane, and that is LDS98498. I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support. You'll find my donor box page there where you can make a monthly or a one-time contribution. We also support the YouTube membership program and, of course, 
float plane as well. We have a bunch of other channels you can find me on, including the audio version of this show on my podcast feed. I'm really trying to build up the audience there, so definitely subscribe. It's on most of the major podcatchers out there. Don't forget also about my Extras channel where we've got supplementary content and unboxings. And then, of course, we've got my Amazon page, which I'm trying to build the followership on. So if you don't mind clicking over there, that'd be really helpful. We have my email list and the Facebook group. Uh, both are great ways to keep in touch with me as to what's going on here. Uh, the Facebook group is a great place to connect with other folks who watch this show, too. So head on over there and sign up. And then we've got my store at lon.tv store where we sell previously reviewed items at low prices. And if you want to get notified every time the store is updated, definitely sign up for my store alert email because there's only one of everything and you don't want to miss out. So definitely sign up and get notified whenever we get new stuff added there. That is going to do it for now. I got a lot of fun stuff planned for the week, so stay tuned for that. I really appreciate your viewership and all of the great comments. Keep those coming. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Mark Bollinger, Sergio Morales, Mark Dell, Jim Callagher, and Stephen Sue. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.